All right, folks, if I could have your attention here, please. Thank you for being here. We are here to celebrate the career and professional legacy of our colleague and friend, Professor and Dean David Logan. And this turnout is fantastic. This is for you. So I will say I'm in my third year as Dean, and it is not always a good thing to have not just one, but two former deans on the faculty. <laughs> uh, but I have been truly blessed to have uh, two former deans on the faculty who are wonderful colleagues and advisors and mentors and indeed friends. David, I have so appreciated and so benefited from your counsel and your thoughts and your insight and your humor. Um, we're going to miss you. We're going to miss you. So David didn't have to come to Roger Williams University School of Law. He had a pretty good gig in North Carolina at Wake Forest. It's, it's an okay school. <laughs> Go Deeks! He was already a nationally renowned scholar, talented, dedicated teacher, beloved by his students. But he came here because there's something about this school and our public service mission, making the world better one student at a time in our own special way. He chose to come here and help take a very good school and help make it even better. And it is better. It's better now than when you came, David. We will continue to try and make it better every year. And we thank you for that. And if you look around this room, this is your legacy. proud of being a part of it. We are all your legacy, right? And the future of all these fantastic students who are going to be the lawyers and leaders of the future, this is your legacy. And when you come back to visit and you see new students and new faculty and new staff, we will be your legacy. You have done something here that is great and makes a difference. And we all hope to leave things a little better than they were when we started. You made things a lot better. So thank you. One of the things I admire most about David is that he is a person of deep principle. He walks the walk and he talks the talk. And he tries to always do the right thing for the right reason. And a good example of that is something that many of you may not know about. When David stepped down from the deanship, uh, was it eight years ago? Yes, eight years. plus. Yes, eight plus. The, um, uh, David and his wife Jeannie established a next generation law student scholarship at this school. And he didn't want it advertised because he did not want that to be somehow maybe awkward for students who were in his class who might have benefited from that scholarship. Doing the right thing for the right reason. So as David concludes his teaching career, as he goes into retirement, North Carolina with family and loved ones. And one of our focuses over the next year and more is going to be to raise more money for that scholarship. So, David, I'm going to turn the mic over to you and thank you. And you may be moving on to a new chapter, uh, but please don't be a stranger. So I'm rocking my John Fetterman outfit today. <laughs> Many of you have never seen me dressed in anything but a shirt and tie. I'm sort of old school that way. Um, but I pulled this sweatshirt out. I said this was sort of a, an appropriate thing. So uh, they say to begin talks with a little joke, right? And I've never really adhered to that, but I'll do this one, which is I can try to be brief, but for obvious reasons, at six foot nine, I can't be short. <laughs> so just, you know, here's the backstory. By the time I was in college, I knew I wanted to be a teacher, sort of, or coach. I, I wanted to be around younger people. I'd done some coaching in the summers and you know, had played on athletic teams and admired a lot of my teachers along the way. And so um, I went off to graduate school after college, and I was in 
studying political science at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, it was a world that, in this respect, isn't that different from the world we live in now, which is there were a lot of PhDs in social sciences that couldn't find decent jobs. And so I was talking to my advisor and it's talking about whether to finish up at my master's or to push on and do something different. So why don't you go to law school? You know, worst come to worst, you can be a lawyer and maybe you can become a law professor. If you're interested in government and stuff like that. And so I ended up my program, went back to DC, worked in DC for a few years, and then went off to law school. And I was lucky to choose to get into the University of Virginia. Uh, I was in state and they just increased the capacity for the first year class, Greg, you'll like this from 250 to 360, they had a new building. And that's why I got in, <laughs> because I would not have gotten in if it was, a, the, it was that, the 250 size. And, and that was significant for a bunch of reasons, but one of them was, um, it was a place that even though it was fancy and everyone was um, you know, highly ambitious and whatever, students seemed to be at the center of the institution. And we can talk a lot about why that might be, even though it's a big state land grant institution, but uh, individual students, I think, felt value there. And there was not a big gap between faculty and students. And so I started stalking some of the faculty and uh, said, you know, how do you go from being a law student to doing your job? And they said, well, get good grades, clerk for a federal judge, work at a big firm, and then apply. Because back then, that was the probably 95% of the faculties were, were being built that way. So I checked all the boxes, went off to DC and practiced. Uh, and um, uh, started teaching on the side at American University as an adjunct. And so I took my first course I taught, the tip to our LP three book, I was a legal writing teacher. Uh, and the, the joys and perils of that particular um, responsibility. And then the next year, Colleen I, and Jonathan, I taught remedies, which I didn't know nothing about, but I would basically stay up till two or three in the morning the night before class, <laughs> and then be semi-prepared up to the minimum number of pages that I had to cover. It was, it was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and the students did not get a quality education experience, but I got a credential. <laughs> so when I went in the market, I was a relatively experienced entry-level teacher, and I got hired by Wake Forest. And I was just lucky because much of what Wake Forest was like without the national orientation was students were at the center. And that doesn't mean that the teachers were easy, doesn't mean that you know, students could coast doesn't mean that students could get away with stuff, although they did have a tradition of three L's getting drunk on the, on the grounds the last day of classes. And that's sort of, uh, once mothers against drunk driving got involved, uh, that, that went by the board. So I started teaching Wake Forest, I did that for 21 years, and um, then I got this itch, and actually started because some people called me and said, do you want to be be a candidate to be a dean. And, you know, I checked a bunch of the boxes. I'd written some stuff and I'd been involved in ABA and LS, stuff like that. And I was getting sort of you know, tired of the same old, same old, and wasn't crazy about living in a red state. Jesse Helms was my senator, and for those of you that are old enough to know, that, you know, that's like, that was like fingernails on a blackboard every time his name, his name was mentioned. And so the idea of going to a blue state and to a startup law school, basically, Michael was on the faculty here, and you were. You were probably the point man recruiter along Roy Nershall and Bob Ken. And uh, I said, wow, this place has got tons of potential. And no one's given them credit for it. They were getting hammered from the Projo. And there were all these stories about our students were dumb and they couldn't pass the bar exam and on and on. And I said, you know, I think we've got some raw material that done right, we can turn this around and make it a student-centered place where success of our students was the most important thing and not the ego of the faculty or, God forbid, the dean. So I did that for 11 years and then seven years ago came back uh, to the faculty. And during that time I continued to teach towards, but I realized this was the perfect job for me. To be able to teach fall 1Ls, the difference between a tort and a tart. <laughs> to tell students about Oliver Wendell Holmes and about Benjamin Cardoza and Learning Hand, these titans of the law from the generations before me that sort of paved the way for the intellectual tradition that we all are part of now. And um, to deal with uh, homicidal patients and falling barrels and uh, plates being grabbed from a black man in a, in a motel. And of course, many, many, many banana peels. <laughs> Some of them brown. Right, <laughs> Res ipsa, right, here we go. But also, 
when I came here, I had a chance to teach some upper level students, and I had this primary board class, and to introduce students to sort of in depth character studies of really interesting people like Felix Frankfurter, Hugo Black, and remarkable visionary leaders like Thurgood Marshall and Earl Warren. That floats my boat almost as much as doing the tort stuff, because again, these are people that shaped the law and that I was sort of on the back end of. I saw these changes coming. And I felt it was my obligation to pass on to the next generations more of an appreciation for this law it didn't just happen. It happened because of courageous people with law degrees making tough decisions, and um, I want you to know about it. So, wow. So my life's work has been a true pleasure, and it rarely felt like a job except faculty meetings. <laughs> and, and this is truly a bittersweet moment. There's an old saying, the days pass slowly but the years fly by, and that's certainly been the case. I turn 73 next week, and 40 plus years in the classroom have passed in what seems like a blink of an eye. But it's important to know when to leave the stage uh, before the audience wants you to leave the stage and you can't do it. And that was a lesson Bob Kent impressed up. He said, you know, Bob was 80 or so when I got here and he kept teaching and he said, when I lose my fastball, tell me. And he did. I said a point came and he retired gracefully and I wanted to avoid Craig having to have that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your service. <laughs> Doddering around uh, the classroom. Um, but I'm clear-eyed about this and, and this is the right juncture. So North Carolina was the logical next place to move. Many of you know I've been living in North Carolina and commuting from Asheville here since the uh, middle of August. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. And primarily, both of my sons live in Winston-Salem. And uh, uh, this is my big reveal. Our first grandchild was born on Saturday night. And so Um, and so I'll be two hours away and God willing be able to watch him grow uh, in, my, in my dotage. So I packed up my Subaru, just about all done, thank you to Shirley and, and Catherine in particular, and I'm ready to head south, you know, for Greg calls it the next chapter. I'm excited by move to Asheville, it's a place of great beauty, and more bears and more breweries than any city in the country. Uh, uh, so if you're ever in Asheville, shoot me an email and we'll pop a cold one. <laughs> and you can join me on what will be my primary job in the next years, which is to sit on my deck looking at the Blue Ridge Mountains. And finally, I wish you peace. Thank you very much.